wherever you want to start. <laughs> um, so thanks for having me this evening. It's a pleasure to uh, speak with all of you about a personal passion of mine, and that's native plants. Um, so I'm, I'm Mark Richardson. I'm the horticulture director at um, New England Botanic Garden just down the street. And um, it sounds like all of you have visited at some point, so I, um, I won't go into a lot of detail about, about the garden, but I will give a little bit of the history of the, of the property um, just very briefly before I dive into the topic. Um, so native plants are really important for a lot of very uh, various reasons, uh, not the least of which being uh, support for a lot of our native songbirds, a lot of our native insects. Um, and there's no better example than our common milkweed. Um, so common milkweed is um, uh, one of the primary uh, host plants for um, monarch butterflies, as you all know. Uh, caterpillars can eat nothing but milkweed. And so if we want to have butterflies in our gardens, we've really got to make sure that we have host plants uh, for the larvae, for the caterpillars to feed on um, before they get to that adult stage that we all enjoy. Um, and what's interesting about this picture is this is actually our daffodil field. I mentioned this just a minute ago. Um, our daffodil field has uh, tens of thousands of naturalized daffodils, not native plants. Um, they do very well in our climate um, and uh, they, they do incredibly well in this field that we have. Um, one thing that's really nice about the way that the daffodil field works is it just turns to meadow um, after the daffodils are gone and a lot of milkweed pops up. So I love the fact that we've got a heavy bloom of daffodils early in the spring, followed by uh, a really fantastic show of milkweed uh, a little bit later in the early part of the summer. Um, so these are the things that I'm going to talk about this evening. First of all, what makes a plant native? So I mentioned a couple plants so far, daffodils not native to our area. Uh, common milkweed definitely native to our area. So I'll talk about what it means to be a native plant, why, um, why that's important, uh, why we should be planting natives, and then I'll go through a list of um, somewhere between 10 and 20 native plants that I think are really fantastic. I, for this talk, I focused really heavily on spring blooms. Um, so you'll see a lot of spring ephemerals, things that are going to be out in the, in the garden in um, pretty short order. Um, so things that you can expect to see pretty quickly. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm from New England Botanic Garden. We had a name change a couple of years ago, or uh, last year. Um, we are uh, the region's uh, botanic garden. That's why we changed our name. We want to make sure that um, people feel welcome uh, no matter where they're from, uh, no matter what their background is. Uh, and we try to be a great example of um, good horticulture in this area. Um, we do uh, a lot of programming throughout the year, a lot of educational programming throughout the year. Um, we also do a lot of outreach programming in the city of Worcester and beyond, um, but mostly we're a place that people just really love to uh, love to enjoy, love to come and visit, uh, love to learn about um, plants, love to see what does well in your area, uh, love to you know take some some examples home, um, love to enjoy the view out across uh, the, the reservoir um, to watch you some mountain, um, love to enjoy the daffodils in the spring. Um, and then uh, we hope that that inspires people to get involved in their communities. Um, we are, uh, several years ago, we adopted uh, the Worcester Tree Initiative, um, which was the organization that was founded to help replant and help advocate for replanting of uh, street trees throughout Worcester. Um, you might remember that there's uh, the, uh, the presence of the Asian longhorn beetle in Worcester, which is an introduced insect pest. Um, that's really detrimental to our uh, native, our uh, natural forests, our native forests in our area, um, because it's got such potential to be um, a threat to our local forests. Uh, there was a huge quarantine zone set up around Worcester, and about 30,000 trees were cut down um, because they, they were found to be harboring uh, the insect. Um, and in response to that, um, uh, Congressman, um, uh, excuse me, uh, drawing a blank on the county's name for some reason, um, but a local congressman uh, and a few other local leaders in the area um, uh, established the Worcester Tree Initiative to basically advocate for um, tree planting and to help plant, replant those 30,000 trees. Worcester Tree Initiative became a part of uh, our organization and is now our outreach program. We do a lot of street tree advocacy work. Um, we help the uh, city water all the newly planted street trees. We do urban beautification. Um, throughout uh, throughout the city. We also give away a lot of free trees. So if you're interested in a tree, we give um, trees away throughout the, uh, throughout Worcester County. Um, and if you know anyone who lives in Worcester that wants a tree, um, you can visit our website and request a tree through our website. 
Um, we're uh, planning to plant uh, 100 plus trees this spring and then another 100 plus trees in the fall. And, um, so we plan on private property. Um, and then um, uh, brand new is our new uh, ramble, our children's garden, which just opened up um, last year. This is uh, actually the uh, architectural drawings for the ramble. And if you visited, uh, you, you can see how closely it resembles the, uh, the drawings that were put together by the architect. We're really happy with the response to the ramble so far. Um, definitely come up and, uh, and check it out. If you've got kids or if you've got grandkids, um, they'll, they'll love to visit. So. We didn't realize it was for kids. I have a picture of my husband in the thing. That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. No, it's definitely, it is definitely <laughs> hard for everybody. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that or, or to hear that. That's, that's really great. The special um, view of what plant, what the lights at the, at the light show. Yeah. That area of the leaf. Yeah, we did a lot of lights in the ramble and the train cool. display. And, and yeah. Things, so it was really good. Um, all right. But back to the meat of the talk. So, um, these are a few definitions I pulled off of uh, Wikipedia a few years ago, uh, and a few other a few other places um, uh, about native plants. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of sort of competing interest, and a lot of um, a lot of different uh, responses to the question, "What makes a plant native?" And so, what I like to do is just try to introduce a few different concepts and ideas. Um, so, uh, Wikipedia says native plants are Plants that are indigenous to a given area in geologic time. The time uh, piece is really important. So this includes plants that have developed, occurred naturally, or existed for many years in an area. Um, so what Wikipedia does is it says um, uh, native plants are those that are indigenous to a given region. So it introduces a couple of important concepts, um, that being place and time. Um, we all know that 12,000 years ago, we were sitting under a, a, an ice sheet that was a mile thick. There wasn't a whole lot of vegetation in the area. Um, so everything that's here had to move up in the last 12,000 years from uh, more southern regions. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we tend to look at a particular snapshot in time and say, um, things are, are needed if they're here at this particular time. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, the National Wildlife Federation says native plants have formed symbiotic relationships with native wildlife over thousands of years and therefore offer the most sustainable habit, habitat. Um, it's not surprising that the National Wildlife Federation would immediately define native plants by their support for native uh, wildlife. Um, <clears throat> but it's totally true. Uh, it's very important um, that we think about not just the, the beauty that's inherent in, in our uh, plants, but also the ecological services that they provide. Um, and native plants tend to support Native insects tend to support native songbirds, um, tend to support a lot of our native wildlife. Um, and so, you know, if you think back to that first image of the, the milkweed, a lot of people aren't the biggest fans of milkweed. Uh, it's pretty aggressive, it's very weedy, um, and it might not be the right choice for your garden, but it's absolutely the right choice if you want monarch butterflies. Um, I have milkweed uh, in the uh, bank along the, um, along the road from my house. Um, and every summer we go out and collect uh, monarch caterpillar eggs and raise a couple of caterpillars um, with my daughter who's five now. Um, and you know, it's just a, uh, it's a lot of fun, but it's, it's only because I have all that milkweed that we're, being, uh, that we're able to do that. Um, and then finally, the Kansas Wild Plant Society uh, had about three pages of, um, uh, of, of written text about what defines a native plant. I pulled just a short piece of it. Um, this is obviously something they thought a lot about, this uh, Wild Plant Society in Kansas. Uh, but they usually, but the, what they said is, um, uh, I think a pretty good definition. They say, um, whether something's native or not has two components, it's geography or place and time. Um, and so uh, it goes on to say, it's usually defined by the botanical community. Native plants are those that originated in a given geographic area without human involvement. And it's that without human involvement piece that's the most important part of this definition. Um, so when I think about native plants, I think about plants that move into a region without the assistance of human beings. Um, and I try not to focus too much on that time period um, because oftentimes in the US at least, it's easy for us to look back and say, well, Columbus landed in 1492, the you know, first European settlers um, came at that time period. So anything that was here uh, before, uh, before Columbus uh, is native. Anything that was, that was here after he landed is non-native. Um, and that gets a little difficult, right? Because there's some 
some plants that may have migrated into the area naturally on their own if given a little bit more geological time, a few more hundred years. Um, and so I think it's important that we think not just about when a plant came to be in a specific area, but how it came to be uh, in that specific area. So um, just want to kind of dwell on that for a little bit. Um, let's talk about this just a little bit more before we move on to the next topic. Um, and just to kind of summarize what we talked about for the last slide, um, when you see most definitions for native plants, uh, there are typically two factors involved that we saw both time and place. Um, most commonly, a plant is uh, considered native if it was here um, at the time of European settlement. So if the European settlers arrived and found it, um, found it in this region, um, then it's considered native. And what, I, what I really wonder is, is, is this the right approach? Um, it sort of takes natural selection and uh, natural uh, movement of, uh, of species across geographic boundaries uh, out of the equation and says, well, um, if it was here then, then it's native. If, if it wasn't here, then it's not. And I think it's better if we, if we look at it slightly differently. Um, there are lots of resources out there available to you to, uh, to generate maps and see if something's native to your particular region. Uh, one of the best um, that I find for visual representation is this one. This is the Biota of North America program. Um, and it's still kept up to date. It's an older looking website, but uh, the data is the data's pretty sound. Um, and what the Florida of North America program does is it shows you county by county um, where plants are, are considered native. And so looking at this map, the dark green uh, just is capturing the state level nativity. So um, if a plant is native to a particular state, it's going to show as dark green on the map. Um, the lighter green is showing you that it's native in that particular county. Um, so uh, a lot of people look at Echinacea, Echinacea uh, purpurea, a purple cone flower, as that sort of prototypical native plant. It's, a, it's very commonly found in um, in native seed mixes. It's often found in garden centers and nurseries and sold as a native plant. It's a great uh, plant for pollinators. Lots of butterflies are attracted to it. Um, you know, lots of insects are really supported by it. Um, but it's not really native to the Northeast. Uh, it's more of a prairie um, plant from the Midwest. And you can see in the map, um, you know, the, uh, a lot of those uh, light green squares and counties uh, in the Midwest, but not really any once you get up into the Northeast. Um, it's actually considered an introduced species here. And I would say, given the geographic distance between here and Ohio and here and, and, uh, and Arkansas, um, you know, you're probably right. This, this is a plant that I would not consider native to New England um, because of the, the distance um, of, its, of its native range. Um, so let's look at this a little bit more. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this plant. This is um, Blue Falls Indigo, Baptisia australis. Um, it's a native plant or a non native plant? So, Baptisia is usually built as a, as a native species. And, and uh, we have a, a Baptisia that isn't native to our area called Baptisia tinctoria. Uh, it's found in the coastline, it has yellow flowers as opposed to the, uh, the sort of indigo colored flowers. Um, but this plant also is native a little bit uh, outside of our region. So it's really native to like, uh, the states above Texas and, and throughout parts of Texas. Uh, so Oklahoma, it's really another you know, sort of Midwestern almost. Uh, um, yeah. On the map, yeah, I'm just clarifying. Like where it's bright green in the center, is that where you're saying it's native? Yep, so, exactly. Okay, but yeah, not so all the those dark. counties that are bright green in the right. center, that's, okay. that's where it's considered native. Okay. Um, there's some divergent populations on those yellow um, places or places where it's historically known from, may or may not still be there, um, which is why it showed up as, as sort of green. It's actually considered in New England invented, which means it's been introduced in the form of naturalizing populations, but it's not really native to our area. It's really native here in the center of the country. Uh, here. Um, botanists will also uh, get really, um, I'll say, into the weeds over whether something is native in a particular county. Um, and so I just want to show this as a representation of, of how this can get really confusing for the layperson to understand whether something's native to their uh, area or not. Um, if you're a botanist, what you're really concerned with is documenting history, where something's historically known to have occurred. 
um, and you uh, will look at herbarium specimens from maybe the 18th century uh, and say, oh yeah, this plant was collected in Berkshire County, Massachusetts in 1799, so uh, I know that it was at least you know, found in the area at that time period. And that's how we know that plants are native to specific areas or not, is through uh, research and uh, looking at those herbarium specimens. Um, the plant down here in the corner uh, is called Photophyllum peltatum. It's our uh, native May apple. Um, it's a spring ephemeral, comes up very early in the spring, um, has these great sort of umbrella uh, shaped leaves, really kind of big. You get it up this, uh, this wide. The plant itself is only about 10 inches or 12 inches tall. Um, it's called May apple because it has a, a small white flower that opens up underneath the foliage. Um, and then that uh, turns into a fruit that's actually eaten by box turtles. Um, and box turtles enjoy it, they eat it, it passes through their gut, uh, and the seed comes out the other end, and that's how May apple is distributed. Um, and so May apple in particular is an example of a plant that takes a long time to migrate um, because it can only migrate as far as a box turtle can walk, <laughs> and then 12 hours or so it takes for them to digest that, that, uh, that fruit. Um, and so, you know, really, when you think about a plant like May apple, I consider this a plant that's native throughout New England. Uh, but if you start to look at a, a map um, closer in of, of New England, for your reference, the dark green counties are places where um, uh, May apple is historically known from. Dark purple counties are where May apple now has naturalizing populations, but it didn't exist back when uh, records were first taken uh, by the first European settlers. So a botanist would look at this map and say, well, May apple's native to Berkshire County, Massachusetts, but it's introduced or non-native throughout the rest of the state. And I find that to be a little, a little bit difficult to really comprehend and a little foolish, right, when we're thinking about whether something's appropriate for our garden and whether we can call something native or not. Um, so from my perspective, May apple's native throughout New England. It's a great plant we should all have it in our gardens. Um, and I don't really care that it uh, was only found from Berkshire County when the first European settlers arrived. Um, so that was all, that'll make a little bit of sense. Um, so the definition that I like to use for native plants is native plants are those that existed in a given region without human introduction. Um, so I like to take the, the time piece out of it um, altogether. I really want to think about how a plant came to be in a particular area versus when it came to be in a particular area. I would like to think that we might consider plants that are uh, from outside of our region, generally very close to it, uh, native in a couple hundred years if they migrate in this area naturally. Um, and so for, for our purposes, we really try to look to uh, what are called the eco regions of New England, and that's what's represented in this drawing here. Um, and these are just areas that, are, that share common uh, environmental um, conditions or, or, uh, or common ecotypes. Um, so you have five different ecoregions that are native to, or that are represented in New England. And what we find is there's a lot of similarities in plants that are native um, to the Cape and Islands uh, as plants that are native to parts of coastal New Jersey. Um, similar soil structure, similar climate, um, uh, similar water patterns, you know, because you're along the coastline. And so if you think about these larger regions as sharing similar cultural properties that are important for plants, then you'll find that a lot of plants that are um, commonly found in you know, the northern parts of the region will also be found in southern parts of the region. And so um, you can kind of consider plants that are native to one part of the region, native to another part of the region. Um, all that aside, um, there are a lot of resources out there for determining whether something's native to your area or not. Bonap is a good one to search. You can just search by a particular plant name and find uh, what counties it's considered uh, native to. Um, and there's also any number of books, um, including a book that I wrote with a colleague a few years ago called Native Plants for New England Gardens, the title of the book. Um, so all that aside, I know that's a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of technical detail. Um, why should we be concerned about this? Why is this something that we want to be included? Why are native plants something that we might want to be included in our gardens? Um, first and foremost, there's a lot of really beautiful native plants out there. Um, and oftentimes they're overlooked because um, they're considered natural or wild, uh, and so we don't always appreciate them for, them for their beauty and include them in our gardens. 
Um, they're not exotic, they're, uh, they're maybe not as special, but, uh, but they're great plants and they're really beautiful. As you can see in the image, here's a, a couple of really shining examples. Um, second and probably more important than the first is uh, when you're working with native plants, you're working with plants that naturally evolved to uh, perform well in the cultural conditions in your backyard. Um, they're, you know, they're used to the, um, the temperature regimes, the, the, the hydrological cycles, the rainfall patterns. Um, they're, uh, they're adapted to the soil conditions that we have. Um, and so when you're using native plants, those are plants that are naturally going to perform well in our region because they naturally evolved here. Um, and so when you're, when you're trying to be a good gardener, you're trying to choose plants that will do well, not just plants that you like to look at. Um, and, and choosing native plants gives you a, sort of a leg up on that. Um, when properly sited, native plants really don't need a whole lot from us. Um, so if you're uh, choosing a native plant, planting in the spot where it, needs, where it wants to be, for example, a plant that grows in the shade is not going to be happy in the sun, whether it's native or not. Um, uh, when properly sited, they don't really need fertilizer or irrigation. Uh, you know, after establishment, you can sort of let the water taps uh, um, off and, and not worry about watering native species because they're naturally adapted to deal with our, our, our soil types and, and our rainfall patterns. Um, native plants provide critical habitat for native pollinators and wildlife. And this is really a, a very important component uh, of uh, choosing native plants for your garden is supporting wildlife. Um, you know, make your make your garden uh, an oasis for uh, native insects, guaranteed you'll attract a lot of birds. Um, our native songbirds feed their young, uh, their fledglings, a diet of about 93% uh, uh, insects when they're, when, they're, um, when they're raising them. Um, and so they really need a lot of insects to feed their young uh, to get them up to uh, maturity. Um, and insects uh, uh, are going to be happier in native species than uh, the non-native species. Uh, a lot of insects are, are specialists, like the monarch butterfly we mentioned before. Monarchs can only feed uh, as uh, caterpillars on milkweed. If you don't have milkweed, you won't have monarch butterflies. Um, there are lots of examples. And then finally, one of the uh, pieces that I really enjoy about working with native plants is they help to reinforce the unique identity of the region. Um, so I lived in the Mid-Atlantic for 10 years. Um, and one of the things I really missed about New England when I lived in the Mid-Atlantic was um, I never saw a stone wall in the woods. Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, that was just something I grew up with. There's stone walls everywhere and there's stone walls all through the woods. And you know that that piece of our cultural identity is really important to me. Um, and it, it sort of represents New England. Um, plants can do the same thing. Um, what's one of the reasons that people come and visit New England in the fall? Color, right? Yeah, so I like to say that people are visiting New England to visit our plants in the fall, right? Because the whole entire world is just ablaze with color. Uh, really what they're looking at is they're looking at maples, they're looking at oaks, they're looking at blueberries. These are all native species. These are all plants that have evolved here over thousands of years. Um, and they really, you know, uh, they really perform well in our climate. Uh, and they're great to look at in the fall. Um, and it's one of those things that makes New England unique. Uh, that fall color. Everybody likes to come and, and move people in the fall um, and visit plants uh, in our region. So, um, hopefully I've convinced you that native plants are a good thing and that we should include more of them in our gardens. Um, and uh, I know I've probably confused you a little bit with how we define native. Um, so now what I'd like to do is just talk about some of my favorite native plants, especially with the spring. Um, and so this is actually three different plants, all in the same genus. Um, so these are, um, uh, on the left is Actea pachypoda. Um, that's a plant called Bal's Eyes. I think you can see why it's called Bal's Eyes. Uh, in the middle is a plant called Actea racemosa. Uh, Actea racemosa is black cohosh. Um, and on the right is Actea rubra. And Actea rubra is called red bug bean. Um, so these are, these are plants that are all in the same genus. Um, I'm sure you remember from like high school biology, genus and species, so we are you know, homo sapiens. Um, so plants uh, follow the same binomial nomenclature. Actea is the genus, um, Pachypoda, Racemosa, and Rubra are different species in the same genus. Um, Actea Pachypoda and Actea Rubra 
bloom in the spring um, for a very short period of time. And then they're, uh, the flowers are followed by this really beautiful fruit set. It almost looks waxy. Um, it almost looks fake, it almost looks plastic. Um, but what's nice about the fruit is that it lasts for a very long time. Um, so both doll's eyes and above me, um, I oftentimes see fruit still lasting on, the, on uh, these perennials um, well into like July and August. Um, so even though the flowers are finished up in say April and May, um, we still have that gorgeous fruit to look at, look at in, uh, in July and August. Um, Actaea racemosa, the uh, black cohosh, um, is a perennial that will get about six feet tall um, and has these beautiful flowers uh, right around the end of June. Um, doesn't have the impressive fruit set as its cousins, um, but is a, is a really robust perennial that does well in a shady garden. Talked about milkweed quite a bit. Um, this is a cousin of the common milkweed that you saw in that first image. Um, this is a Sleepies incarnata or the rose milkweed. Um, you'll hear some people call it the swamp milkweed. Um, swamp milkweed tells you what, that it grows well in wet soils. Um, and I like to call it rose milkweed because I don't know a lot of people that like swamps. And this is a great plant um, and it does really well just in average garden soils. Um, it has uh, uh, flowers that are uh, very fragrant. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons why it goes by the moniker rose milkweed is because of the fragrance of the flowers. Um, this is another perennial. So for the most part, when I talk about perennials, those are herbaceous plants that will completely die back to the ground for the winter. And they'll come up in the spring. Um, they'll have foliage on them for the spring, sometimes attractive, uh, really attractive foliage. They'll flower, they'll set seed, and then they'll, they'll die back to the ground in the frost in the fall. Um, so a sleepy synchronata rose milkweed. Great plant, also very supportive of uh, monarch butterflies. Monarchs will feed on, on, uh, on rose milkweed. Um, and then another cousin to the milk, uh, milkweeds I've talked about already is the Sclupius tuberosa. Um, this is the butterfly milkweed. Butterfly milkweed has these bright orange flowers. They're absolutely gorgeous, really stunning, um, kind of early summer uh, flower set. Um, this one grows in dry, sandy soils, whereas the rose milkweed grows well in wet, um, kind of mucky soils. Um, so this is, this is a great one for the edge of the driveway too. It's a coastal plant. It'll take uh, a lot of salt. Um, so this is actually one that would do really well on the site we were talking about before. Um, full sun, exposed site, dry sandy soils, um, and just beautiful orange flowers uh, in, the, in the early part of the summer. Um, one thing about milk is they all produce uh, pods and the pods burst open uh, and scatter seed. Um, and so the, uh, if you want to grow more milkweed, um, you can collect the pods and you can you know, sow seed and it's very easy to grow them. You can also just scatter the seed in places that you want to see it. Um, um, but it's, uh, it's, yeah, so it produces an abundance of seed, spreads around. So if you have one milkweed plant, you're likely to have a lot more the following season. It does, it does see it around all over the place. Um, shifting a little bit from the milkweeds, this is a, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with bleeding heart. It's a pretty common garden plant. Um, but that's a European species. This is Dicentra exinia, which is a wild bleeding heart. Um, and uh, for as delicate as this plant looks with its sort of lacy, you know, sort of delicate uh, foliage, um, and those adorable flowers that look like a heart. Um, this plant's tough as nails. Uh, we had a, a greenhouse or a place where I used to work um, where this plant would actually grow right next to the greenhouse uh, on the outside of the greenhouse. It was exposed, sandy, rocky, terrible soil, um, you know, hardly got any water ever, and it would bloom straight through the summer. Um, uh, this plant typically blooms in spring, uh, but can often bloom for a, a really long period of time. It'll bloom, uh, it'll bloom into the summer uh, pretty often. It'll grow in a rock crevice like we see here in a rock garden. Um, it'll also just do well in, in average garden soils too. Um, and it can get pretty robust, you know, maybe about 12 inches by 12 inches. Um, it has beautiful um, pink flowers that primarily bloom in the spring. Um, one of our, uh, a great example of a native ground cover is wild strawberry. Um, so I know you're all familiar with strawberries. Um, strawberries are actually hybrids. Uh, this is another uh, wild strawberry. This is from Virginiana, uh, which is our, our native wild strawberry. 
This plant will do really well in full sun, um, will do very well in dry sites. Um, produces um, tiny little flowers. Uh, strawberries are in the rose family, like apples. So they kind of look like apple blossoms. Um, and the flowers are followed by really tasty fruit. Um, the fruit is quite small, maybe about this size, um, and just packed full of sugar. So they're really flavorful um, for as small as they are. Um, I like to use this as a lawn alternative. Um, so I had to give a whole other talk about uh, killing the lawn. And I can talk for days about wild strawberry and its virtues as a lawn replacement. Um, it's a gray, dense, green ground cover. Um, and if we're honest with ourselves about what our lawns are used for, and for the most part, it's for looking at. Uh, and that greenery is important. And wild strawberry is a really good example of a plant that um, forms a dense, nice, dense green mat that, uh, that works as a good lawn alternative. <clears throat> Um, example of a uh, true spring ephemeral. So this is uh, bluebells, Mertensia virginica. Um, Virginia bluebells uh, comes up really early in the season. So spring ephemeral, I've used that term a couple of times, um, is a plant that's ephemeral. And ephemeral just means fleeting, right? Short, long, uh, short lasting, uh, not long lasting. Spring ephemerals take advantage of the fact that trees haven't leaked out yet early in the spring. Um, but soils have warmed up, the sun's shining brightly, um, they emerge very early, um, they flower very quickly, they set fruit, and then they go dormant for the rest of the season. So by the time they've completed their life cycle for the year, um, the leaves have come out of the trees and it's getting shady and dark and they no longer have access to the, to the sun for photosynthesis. Um, we have lots of different examples of spring ephemerals. Um, but Mertensia virginica is a really good example of a spring ephemeral that's native to our region. Beautiful blue flowers. Um, sometimes after they're pollinated, they fade to a pink. Uh, there are white variants of, of Virginia bluebells. I don't know a lot of people that are after a white bluebell, um, uh, <laughs> but they are. It is interesting that every once in a while we get a white, uh, a white flower popping up in the field of uh, bluebells. Um, the foliage, when it first comes up in the spring, almost looks like lettuce starts. It's got that sort of vibrant green that a, 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 a lettuce plant would have. Um, they get about 12 or 18 inches tall, bloom for a couple weeks before they die back to the ground for dormant for the, uh, the rest of the season. Uh, really beautiful. I like anything with blue flowers. So Virginia bluebells got me. Uh, they work really well in combination with some of our other spring ephemerals. So in this image, you can see. Trillium grandiflorum, that's the white uh, lake robin, that's the, the white flower. Um, and also a plant that I like a lot called uh, wood poppy, it's the yellow, it's uh, Stylophorum that go on um, wood poppy. A couple of different phlox species. So this one is Phlox de Barricada. Um, phlox are pretty common garden plants. There's one called um, uh, moss phlox, which is uh, going to come to me in a second. Um, but Phlox of Ericot is a great woodland um, phlox, so this is one that will do well in a shade garden. Um, blooms right around Mother's Day, so if you're looking for a good Mother's Day gift, this is definitely a great Mother's Day plant. Um, it's very fragrant uh, and uh, forms a nice mat of, of foliage. Um, works really well in a shade garden. Um, produces an abundance of flowers um, in the, uh, in the uh, spring, right around Mother's Day. Looks really great with a couple of other um, native species that I'll talk about in a second. So can I ask, all these flowers that you've shown us, these are at Townsville? No, um, so these are various places. So oh. everything that you'll see uh, is at Tower Hill, but the pictures aren't from Tower Hill for the most part. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Does that make sense? Yes, I'm just trying to figure out when, when I should go back and Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you see a lot of flocks in the inner park, our native plant garden. You also see a lot of flocks in the cottage garden and in other, other, other shady spots in the garden. Um, flocks in the TRL, which I'll talk about in a minute, is another plant that you'll see right here in the um, Just about everything that you've seen in these slides is something that we have at Tower Hill. So uh, I have a new expanded uh, we expanded our vegetable garden last year planted a lot of wild strawberries so there's a ton of wild strawberry um, we also planted a lot of wild strawberry around the orchard where we uh, restored the orchard uh, two seasons ago now um, we planted a lot of wild strawberries at ground cover around the young trees um, 
the uh, milkweed, we have milkweed all over the place, uh, the, the butterfly milkweed, that bright orange one, um, you'll find that in a lot of different parts of the garden. Um, the rose milkweed you would find in the Nadeau garden, which is to the north of the, um, of the conservatories. Um, I don't remember every plant that I showed you, but yeah, most, just about everything that you've seen, you, um, you'll see it in the for sure. Um, so just a couple more images of, uh, of wild blue fox. Here it is in tight bud before the flowers open. Um, here it is, you can get kind of a close up view of what the flowers look like. Um, that's foam flower, which I'll talk about in a second. This is May apple. Uh, this is Plotone peltata. This is the one that I showed earlier. Um, so here you can see the flower. Um, and there you can see what the uh, foliage looks like when it first emerges. Um, it, I love this plant. Uh, and in a, in a dense colony, um, it's just so, so great to see it. Um, what does this need for sun? So this one's shade. This shade. is definitely a shade. shade. Yep, uh, definitely one shade. Um, and it's rhizominous, which means it has an underground stem and will spread around quite a bit. Um, it also means that you can dig it up from your neighbor's garden and bring it home and it'll, it'll, it'll transplant very well. Um, I like to plant it on a slope um, so that I can look up and see the flower, because otherwise you're down on your hands and knees. Uh, to check out. Uh, the flower is very, very fleeting. It doesn't last particularly long, um, but the fruit is long lasting. And, um, wouldn't recommend eating the fruit. This is in the barberry family. I think it's it's maybe toxic, um, but uh, but fox turtle certainly love it. So. Is it toxic to other yeah, like no, to deer or anybody no, like that? No, deer will eat it. Uh, you know, for the most part, wildlife knows what they can and can't eat. Um, uh, you know, certain uh, pheromones or fragrances that they can smell with fruit. I mean, that's not not something they want to eat. Um, this is Pycnanthemum muticum, broadleaf mountain mint. Uh, this is a perennial that does very well in uh, dry uh, sites, also does very, very well in wet sites. Um, it's, uh, it's very sun tolerant, uh, does extremely well in exposed um, locations. Um, what I like about Pycnanthemum is it has um, tiny little flowers. So uh, there's little flowers atop the uh, stems that you're seeing here. Um, if you get down and look closely at the detail, Quite beautiful, um, but they also have uh, bracts just below the flowers. That's what these sort of um, uh, dusky looking or sort of uh, lighter green leaves are. So a bract is just a modified leaf. You think about a poinsettia. Um, poinsettia is, you know, the showy part of a poinsettia is, is what looks more like a leaf. It's a bract, it's a modified leaf that's part of the floral um, structure and it's really beautiful. Um, same thing here with Broadleaf Mountain Men. Um, the rack is the showiest part of it. It's kind of silvery, uh, lighter green, um, and, and long lasting. Um, this is a true mint. It has a square stem like all mints do, and you can, you can eat it. Um, I have a lot of this out in front of my, uh, my house, and my, my five year old daughter knows that uh, this is one of the plants in the garden that she eats, so she's constantly picking leaves off of it and eating it. Um, and always giving us leaves and you know, seeing if we want to eat it too. It's also a great attractant to a lot of uh, pollinators. You can see a bumblebee on the image there on the left. Um, so usually when this is in bloom, you can just sit there and count like dozens of species that are attracted to it. So it's a pollinator magnet um, and really enjoyable for that reason too. Um, this is a great little ground cover it's called Sabaldiopsis trivitata, a 3 tooth syncofoil. Doesn't get much taller than maybe three or four inches. Um, tough as nails, does very well in uh, dry sites with uh, exposed, uh, you know, lots of exposure to sun. Can get pummeled with salt all winter long. It doesn't skip a beat. This would be a great plant for, uh, for your spot. Um, it's also in the rose family, so it gets little white flowers uh, that look like apple blossoms as well. Um, and it turns a beautiful uh, purple maroon in the fall. Um, and uh, this is it actually interplanted with um, a plant called Phlox subulata, the moss phlox, the name I forgot earlier, um, that blooms uh, white to pink to purple um, uh, in the spring. So I like this combination together because they're, they're both evergreen, slightly different colors for the, uh, for the winter, um, but the, the fall color and winter color in Sabaldiopsis is fantastic. I just planted up at the top of my driveway, um, and it gets hammered with a lot of salt spray um, from the plow every single winter. Um, doesn't skip a beat, could care less about that, and, uh, and just is a really nice, dense ground cover. I like plants that 
can outcompete weeds, so I don't have to do as much weeding. Um, and Sabaliopsis is one of those. It's just it's very dense. It's actually a little shrub. It's a woody plant, um, and it's uh, it's just a great great garden plant. You've seen this one in a couple of other images, but this is foam flower, T.R.L. cordifolia, the uh, picture on the left. Um, it does really well in combination with a couple different species of phlox, phlox libericata, I mentioned before, and also phlox stolonifera, which is a creeping phlox. Um, similar flower colors um, with phlox. Um, the foam flower has those uh, small white flowers, blooms again around Mother's Day, um, but what I like about uh, foam flowers also has really attractive foliage, um, and the foliage character um, changes from plant to plant. So um, these are leaves, uh, pictures of leaves that I took um, in a stand of foam flower that were all grown uh, from the same seed source. So they all have the same parents, basically. And you can see how much difference there was in the, in the foliage um, from the uh, you know, deeply lobed uh, leaf with a little bit of gloss to it in the top left. Uh, to this one here that's entirely doesn't have those deep lobes, kind of mottled coloring on it that gets more pronounced as the uh, leaf gets bigger and bigger throughout the season. Um, and so this is all the same species. Um, and I love the fact that the flowers will all come up at the same time, they'll all bloom at the same time. Um, but when you start to look around at the foliage, you see a lot of variation and a lot of different characteristics showing up in the foliage. Um, there's a cultivar of TRL color folia called um, Running Tapestry that actually I think the one that's in the right hand image here. So this foliage right here I think is Running Tapestry, which is a dense, dense ground cover. Um, glossy foliage and that sort of coloration, that modeling on the surface of the leaf, really beautiful. Flowers are fleeting, but that foliage is really interesting. Um, forms a nice dense mat um, for, the, uh, for, the, for the summer months. Um, some shrubs. So this is Hemimelis virginiana, our native witch hazel. This blooms, this is the last thing to bloom in the fall. So typically it's blooming even as late as Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, they bloom in late October into November. Um, has those really interesting yellow strap-like uh, petals. Um, it is slightly fragrant um, and the, the shrub itself has great fall color. Um, we have a we have fall blooming witch hazel, which grows naturally in our area all over the place. So if you're hiking in, uh, you know, in and around uh, Tower Hill or any place around here in the fall, you'll see tons of witch hazel in bloom in like October and November. Um, the foliage can be this color, it can also be yellow in the fall when it starts to drop. Um, but then once the foliage drops, you really see the flowers. The flowers really pop. Um, this can get about 12 or 15 feet tall, so it's a pretty large shrub. Um, does well in kind of back border um, uh, behind your house. Um, and it just gives you that, uh, that, that great foliage for the summer, uh, nice fall color, and then those beautiful flowers in the fall. Yeah, really interesting. This is our native hydrangea. There's lots of different hydrangeas, but this one's native. This is hydrangea arborescence or smooth hydrangea. Um, just a note about this. On the right is a cultivar called Annabelle. A lot of people are familiar, familiar with Annabelle hydrangea. Has that typical sort of mop head uh, flower, uh, that, that inflorescence. Um, these flowers are all sterile. Um, so, what that means is they don't produce pollen, they don't produce nectar, they have no uh, sexual structures, so they don't produce any fruit. If you know anything about plants, you know that they have to have pollen in order to be pollinated, to produce fruit, and then to create that next generation. Um, so, um, the picture on the left is what um, hydrangea arborescence flowers look like um, when they're fertile. So fertile flowers are those that have pollen, have nectar, uh, will attract pollinators to them, um, will set seed and create new young plants. Um, the hydrangea arborescence anabelle on the right is beautiful. It's a very showy flower. Uh, a lot of people like it, um, uh, you know, in kind of a perennial border. Um, uh, but it doesn't provide as many uh, um, ecosystem services as the plant on the left does, because the plant on the left provides nectar for pollinators, particularly bumblebees and other, other pollinators that need those floral resources. Um, so smooth hydrangea, if, if you like Annabelle on the right, I'd suggest buying a few of them, buy one Annabelle, and then buy some natural species um, so that you can still support pollinators in your garden. 
Another shrub that's native to our area is mountain laurel. Um, <laughs> so this is actually the state flower of Connecticut. Um, mountain laurel has a lot of variation in the, in the flower. So there are lots of cultivars out there. Uh, one called carousel, it's got a really beautiful sort of pinkish flower. Um, you'll oftentimes find really interesting stripes uh, on, the, on the flowers. Uh, um, they almost look fake before they open uh, and all after they open too because the, the colors are so uh, striking. Mountain laurel is oftentimes billed as a great evergreen um, shrub. Um, I always say it's a stretch to consider this plant evergreen because um, this is what it typically looks like in the winter. I don't really consider that an evergreen. It doesn't have a whole lot of evergreen foliage. You've got some little wisps of leaves up toward the top, but not a ton. Um, so, but it's also very beautiful. It's kind of structure, uh, sculptural. Um, and I like to allow mountain laurel to get to its full potential and really kind of stretch. It'll get 20 feet tall if you let it. Um, and in the winter, covered in snow with a little bit of that, uh, that leaf color, or that leaf cover, uh, I just find it a really beautiful shrub in the, in the winter. They bloom every year. Um, oftentimes with mountain laurel, the deer will actually eat the flower buds. Um, so if you have deer um, and you've got mountain laurel, they'll just, they don't really like the foliage very much, but sometimes they do, but they'll really nip the flower buds. Flower buds are really tasty, I guess. So you might not see flowers because the deer came through and nipped all the flower buds off. Very, very frustrating to go after. Um, this is spice bush and there are benzoin. So this is a shrub that really wants to grow in wet soils. Um, it's incredibly fragrant. Uh, this is one of the first plants I teach my kids to identify um, because we'll snap off the twig and scrape the bark off. And it's, uh, it's just got this amazing fragrance. You can, uh, you can stew it in a cup of hot water. It makes a, a really nice tea. Um, and uh, it has these uh, really interesting yellow flowers that come out in the uh, uh, early, early spring. This is one of our first native, uh, one of our first plants to bloom um, in our natural woodlands. Uh, and then, uh, this is a plant of dioecious, which means they're separate male and female plants. Um, the females will get these bright red berries. Um, the males just produce pollen, they don't produce fruit. Um, but the, uh, the fruit is really beautiful. So, yeah, for like for one like that, you would need to get one of each in order for it to. If you want fruit, you really have to have a male and a female. Um, but because it's so common in our area, um, if you were to buy a female plant, uh, <laughs> you're more than likely close enough to a male plant that you get. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. This is rhododendron maximum, um, the, the tall, tall shrub. Most people know what rhododendron foliage looks like, so I don't bother um, showing it. This one blooms in kind of mid to late June. Um, again, I, I really like to limit this plant up and expose some of the structure, the sculptural uh, sort of uh, quality of it. Most people um, try to chop it to the ground. Uh, this plant will get 25 feet tall. Um, does really well shade, very uh, fast growing plant. Um, this is actually, uh, how many of you are familiar with the term for invasive species? You know what invasive species is? So, rhododendron maximum is an invasive species in Ireland. Uh, it's incredibly happy and it's completely taken over a lot of areas. So, uh, it's, it's not often we think about our native plants as being invasive in other countries, but they certainly are. But it's a great plant for gardens in our area. A um, few different uh, um, Viburnum. So on the left, you have Viburnum antimonides and hobble bush, um, which really does well in our area where we're at a slightly high, higher elevation. Um, it wants a cooler summer environment um, than uh, most of Massachusetts, but this does particularly well in Massachusetts. Uh, we have it in Tower in a couple different places, and it does great. Uh, the wither rod, Viburnum nudum, um, and then Viburnum aceriform and the maple leaf I've got in the right here with uh, really beautiful flowers. Viburnum acerifolium is an understory shrub that grows in a dry oak forest, so it does really well in uh, dry environments. Um, Viburnum nudum does really well in, uh, in very moist soils, but also will do well in uh, kind of average garden soils. All of these have fantastic fall color. Um, all of them have really beautiful fruit. Um, so Viburnum is a truly like a three season shrub um, because it's got Great spring flowers, great uh, fall color, um, great fruit set for the summer. 
Just a few more before we wrap up for the night. This is Carrots Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Sedge, and I include this because I think it's one of our best lawn alternatives. Um, so you know that lawns need irrigation, they need fertilizer, uh, oftentimes they need fungicides and other pesticides. Um, so anything we can do to uh, be a little more ecologically friendly um, is, is great, and moving away from lawns is certainly something that we should all be trying to do. Carrots Pennsylvanica is not a grass, it's a sedge, so it's related to grasses, but not a true grass. It does really well in dry, shady sites. If you have a spot in your garden where you try to grow lawn and uh, you're you know, uh, defeated because the, the trees are shaded out, this is the perfect plant for you. Um, Carrots Pennsylvanica uh, does really well in the shady spots. Um, looks a lot like grass. You can mow it, uh, although you don't have to. It only gets about eight, eight inches tall. Um, this is the one that uh, we had at Garden Woods where I, I worked previously. We would mow it twice a year. Um, once right around uh, June 15th, we had an event um, <laughs> where we used this as a lawn. And then once at the very end of the season, um, so right around September, October, we'd mow it so it would look like a lawn all through the winter. Um, this is before we started that practice, we would just kind of let it go shaggy for a while. Um, but I, I prefer it. I prefer it mowing, so it looks more like a, tr a traditional lawn. Never have to water it, never have to fertilize it, never have to apply any pesticides, pesticides to it. It doesn't it's grow in full sun, though. No, definitely okay. not. Yeah, okay. Definitely shade, shade there. So if you were to transition a garden to that, would you have to totally dig up all the grass that was there and put it, or? So if it's a shady spot, yeah. what I would do is I would, um, there's a couple things you might try. Um, so if the grass is thriving and doing well, you're going to want to kill the grass first. Um, yeah. So an easy way to do that is to use something called ram board, which is a uh, really thick paper. You can buy it in rolls at a hardware store, roll that across the surface, yeah. um, and then bury that in compost. Yeah. Um, and then you can plant carrots and salmonica directly into the compost. Um, so that would be one way to do it. Um, uh, something else you could do is you could just, you know, if the grass isn't really thriving, it's not doing very well, and you can just kind of rake it up. Yeah, rake it up and get it out of there. Um, if it's really not doing well, you could just plant carrots directly into it, and the carrots would out compete it pretty easily. Uh, you take over. Um, a couple of ferns. So this is Allianz and Pedatum, the maiden hair fern, has this wiry, what we call rachis, which is the, the stem of the fern leaf. Um, that's that's black. Uh, this plant again, like um, uh, the Gessentria eximia I talked about earlier, that looks very delicate. This plant looks very delicate, but it's tough as nails. Um, uh, does really well in peak sites. Does fine in dry soils. Um, and once it's established and happy and growing, it'll, it'll spread quite a bit. Um, all ferns produce a fiddlehead. So the fiddlehead is just what we call that um, that fern frond that's first emerging in the spring. So this is what the um, maidenhair fern fiddlehead looks like when it first comes out. It is not edible. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind. We, only, we have one edible um, fiddlehead in our area, and it's this one. This is Matusia strupiocaris, the fiddlehead fern, or sometimes called ostrich fern. Um, and a fiddlehead fern will get this tall. Uh, it's a very, very big plant. It's a very aggressive plant. Um, when it's happy in the area, it will just completely colonize that area and take over. Um, but I find it really beautiful. It's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a great plant. I love the size of it. I love, you know, it, it definitely feels like it's out of the dinosaur ages. Uh, it's you know, very sort of ancient looking, um, and I, I really like it a lot. But it, it is one that uh, will, you know, take over an area um, pretty easily if it's, if it's happy. Definitely wants a little bit of shade and will do better in moist soils and dry sites. Um, one thing about uh, fiddlehead fern is what you saw in the previous image um, are the uh, vegetative fronds. So those fronds um, don't produce spores. Um, ferns don't flower, uh, they, they produce spores on, typically on the undersides of the of their leaf. Um, and those spores are how they produce new ferns. Um, well, fiddlehead fern actually has two different sets of, uh, of fronds. It has the vegetative frond that you saw earlier, um, but it also has these uh, fertile fronds that come up and only get about this tall. And the fertile fronds produce spores. Um, so it's pretty interesting. These dry um, and turn kind of a rich chocolate brown. So a lot of times in the garden, what I, what I like to do is um, 
when I cut back fiddlehead fern in the fall, I'll leave the fertile ferns up um, all winter. They look great um, surrounded by snow through the winter. Um, and again, it's just this great sort of sculptural element that you can see in the garden. Only about this tall, so you know, an eight inch snowstorm is gonna mostly cover them up. But a nice snow dusting or two or three inches, uh, they look really beautiful. Um, and then on the left, you can see what the uh, fiddleheads actually look like as they're coming out. Um, and these are edible, uh, so you can saute them up in some garlic and butter and they taste really good. Another fern that I like that's a good ground cover is Fidalkers canatillus, the long beach fern. Um, what's interesting about this one is the frond uh, comes up, uh, or the, the sort of leaf stem, the rachis comes up and then it bends this way. So um, it, you know, uh, the leaf is actually held parallel with the ground, if you will. Um, so it makes a really nice ground cover. Um, shades out the soil below it um, and it works really well as kind of a mat forming um, fern. Um, and uh, just very nice foliage, but is a, is a really good ground cover. Ground cover. I mentioned this resource before, but this is the uh, Bonaf, the Biota of North America program. So if you visit the website, this is what it looks like. Like I said, it looks very old, uh, but the data is very, very good. Um, so on the left-hand side um, are links to list plants by genera. Um, and so if you know the plant's Latin name, um, you can click that button and then you can search for uh, the, the plant and then pull up range maps like the ones that you've seen um, before. So this is Fugopteris connectilis. This is the fern we were looking at a second ago. Um, you can see that all those light green counties are places where Fugopteris connectilis is native to. Um, so bone apps are a great resource. If you are interested in the plant and want to see if it's native to our area, you can just do a quick check on bone app. Um, and it'll, it'll, it'll spit out a map like this and, and show you exactly where it's um, historically made from. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. This is a copy of the book. Uh, I understand it checked out. Uh, it's right currently now. checked out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it was uh, timely, you know, people are thinking about spring and wanting to plant, so I'm not surprised it was checked out. Um, but look for it. Uh, you can find it on the Amazon. We have it in the gift shop uh, at the top of the garden. Um, you can grab a copy of it there. That website you shared with me earlier, mm -hmm. um, would it also say if, like, say, like the fruit of something is poisonous? Um, no, I don't think we talk about whether the fruit's poisonous on something or not. No. There are very few examples where you'll find something that's um, poisonous. Um, and uh, even fewer examples of something where poisonous doesn't mean anything more than it'll, it'll make you a little bit sick, you know, make you feel kind of bad. Um, so there's a, you, I'm sure you're all familiar with yew. Uh, uh, you know, it's a very common foundation plant, evergreen, um, needles. Um, yew are uh, toxic. So the, the cone of the yew is quite toxic. Um, but um, you really have to break into the seed to release the toxin. Um, and humans just don't have the, the, uh, the jaw strength to be able to break into it to get the toxin out of it. Um, so even though it's highly toxic, it's not really a concern for people because um, you just you can't bite down hard enough, hard enough on it to, to actually, uh, to actually you know, release the toxin. Um, and, um, so there's lots of examples like that of a plant that, you know, the, the fruit's poisonous, but it really doesn't mean that you're going to die if you eat it. You might get a stomach ache and you, know, you might, feel good, yeah, yeah. Might, might not feel good for a little bit, but it's, it's not going to, it's not really going to hurt you. So if you're interested in buying certain native plants, yep. where would be a good source? So one of the best sources locally is Bigelow Industries um, in North Carolina. So Bigelow sells a ton of native plants. Um, and they're really real advocates for native plant um, uh, native plants if you're using native plants in your garden um, so Bigelow's would be one of my uh, primary resources in our area um, Garden Woods uh, in Framingham has a, a great retail uh, nursery they sell a ton of native plants um, there most nurseries will have at least some array of native plants a lot of them will make a big deal of it 
Um, there's a line of um, native plants uh, uh, called American Beauties um, that's been produced in, it's a partnership between Pride's Corner Farm down in Connecticut, a wholesale nursery, and North Creek Nurseries in Pennsylvania, which is another wholesale nursery. You can find American Beauties uh, all over the place. They, they're, they're sold in branded pots that say mm -hmm. American Beauties on the side of them. Um, and those are all really well-tested, well, -tested, well uh, like high-performing native, native plants. Um, so I recommend looking for American Beauties. Um, but yeah, Big Ol' is right down the street. It's a great place to get natives. I have an online question. Right. Um, they said, thank you very much. And then they also asked, is Trillium native? They have a bunch of it. Yeah, so we have uh, four different Trillium that are native to New England. Um, so Trillium grandiflorum is the white wake robin. It's the one that I showed in the uh, picture before. We also have uh, one called Trillium erectum. It's a red Trillium, or uh, red, red, I think we call that one toe shade. Um, so that's another native one. Uh, painted trillium, trillium orgulatum is another native, and then um, trillium cernuum, which is a nodding trillium. Um, and I've found trillium cernuum growing naturally around here, trillium orgulatum growing naturally around here. Um, erectum and graniflorum I haven't seen except in the garden, uh, but yes, uh, there's four of them that are native. There's about, there's more than 30 species of trillium that are native to North America. Most of them are native to the, the East Coast. Um, but those are the only four that are truly native in New England. They said thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only question. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, so yeah. all this color is making me excited to go back to town. Yeah, when do you recommend us roughly come back? Like, you know. Well, I mean, any any day is a good day to go back. <laughs> 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 Uh, so we already have we already have bulbs coming up. So there's a lot of snowdrops already up in the garden. There's a lot of crocus already up in the garden, covering a little bit of snow right now. Um, but before you know it, the daffodils are really going to start to color up soon. Um, so the daff the peak of the daffodil field is usually mid April, somewhere around April 15th. That's a great time to come um, for a spring visit to see a lot of bulbs. Um, and you know April 15th to April 30th, right in that. Window is a great time to see daffodils. We've got daffodils everywhere. Um, so when do you plant all the tulips? Uh, in the fall. In the fall. Yeah. So October, in November, maybe you do that annual. Correct. Uh, yeah. So tulip. We treat tulips like annuals. Yeah. Um, because they're so susceptible to uh, different fungal pathogens, they just don't do particularly well um, as perennials. Um, so we, we rip all the tulips out every year and plant new ones. But more and more, we're planting fewer and fewer tulips um, because a lot of a lot of what we're trying to do is incorporate a lot more sustainable practices in the in the work that we do. So we plant a lot of naturalizing bulbs that do um, become perennials in the garden. So that's why we have so many daffodils, hyacinths, uh, things like crocuses, and species tulips, which tend to be a little smaller. Um, um, but yeah, tulips are tulips are great, but they're they're um, right. They work, yeah. yeah, they work for sure. And all the forest bulbs you do, do you do those or do you get those from another? We don't do a ton of forest bulbs. We used to do a lot more forest bulbs than we, than we do now. Uh, with the orchid show, that kind of takes up that time that period when we would have done a lot of forest bulbs in the past. Yeah. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the indoor bulb displays that we have are um, uh, the plant societies doing, uh, doing shows. Okay. Um, so like the Daffodil Society yeah. that I mentioned before. Um, I'd like us to do some more forest bulbs because you know the orchids are going to disappear starting on Monday next week. Um, we have kind of a little bit of a lull bef uh, in between when the orchid show ends and when the, uh, the outdoor bulbs are really you know kind of going gangbusters. Um, that'd be the perfect time period for us to have some you know forest bulbs indoors. Um, it's just it's tough to have enough hours in the day to get to get out of that done with the orchid show. Any other questions? If you do have any, I did, I did not include my email address in the last okay. slide, but I can give it to you. It's um, uh, M, it's a little long, it's M Richardson. No, no period. No period, no, just M Richardson at uh, neug.org. 
Yeah. 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 That's easier than my email address is plants at mdg.org. Um, so please feel free to use that too. Um, I, I'm the one that monitors that. So if a uh, question comes through there, or if you got my email address wrong, um, you don't hear back from me, or just send it to me. So, so I have a question. I know we went over like a lot of flowering plants and whatnot, um, but for ground cover, is there any native, like, uh, I guess it's the juniper, the low juniper that is, my yeah, husband actually, loves this and I never let him have it because we lived in Texas. Sure. We lived in a, in a house that was more tropical and I was like, mm. and so now I want to yep. try and leave it. <laughs> um, so yeah, ground cover is great, um, and there's tons of examples that uh, low ground cover juniper. Some of those junipers are native. Okay. Um, so they're not all native, but some of them are. So, so okay. Yep. Okay. Um, the uh, Sabaldiopsis trivitata that I mentioned before is a really fantastic one. It's uh, the three tooth sinker foil. That's the one that had the great winter color. Um, another one I like <coughs> to use is called bearberry. Um, that's a little bit easier than like be eat. Like, Bear, like the animal. Okay. <laughs> um, bearberry is another coastal uh, plant. Tolerates salt. Tolerates exposed sites, sandy soils, um, dry dry sites, evergreen foliage, um, map forming, spreading, okay. um, and produces a red fruit that looks like a cranberry. Okay. Um, so bearberry is a really good one. Um, um, there's a ton of grasses out there that really work well as ground covers too. Um, yeah, but he really grasses. wants this juniper looking thing. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, um, species that would be um, So it's just like creeping juniper. It's a native, it's a native species. I will say I get a lot more people saying they want placements for the ground cover juniper. Really? Um, than yeah, but he's never had it, so he won't know. He'll, mm -hmm. he'll like it for a while. It's fine. I, I, <laughs> no, I, I don't <laughs> We lived in Texas, so every, we had like a lot of banana trees, and we have a lot of very tropical stuff. Oh, and that's fun. you know, and now that we're here, I'm like, all right, now we can have the, to me the evergreen yeah. stuff. So, so juniper stores and talus. It's easy to remember. It's horizontal. Okay. The juniper stores and talus, and then the juniper. My son would love you. He knows all these genus and species names. Mm -hmm. So if I can get to the fungus and this nice. and that, nice. and I'm like, who do I have no idea what you're saying? <laughs> That's uh, creeping juniper. You can find that pretty much anywhere. Okay. I think there's a cultivar called Bar Harbor. Um, so it has kind of blue green foliage. Uh, Bar Harbor is, you know, Bar Harbor mm -hmm. uh, It's a native, native one. So, okay. Yeah. If everybody knows that, I just want a quick look. We have library passes for Tower Hill for 50% off, but if you're a Boston resident, you can go with it for free because the Cultural Council gives the money to support that program. And I used to be the treasurer for the Cultural Council. So I used to process those things. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so we support Tower Hill for sure. It's mm -hmm. really fun. So, yeah. We appreciate it. We yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.